I departed from Kinley Field at 8.41am hours, my ETA at Kingston, 2.10pm hours. I am flying in good visibility at 18,000 feet. I flew over 150 miles south of Kinley Field at 9.32 hours. My ETA at 30 degrees north is 9.37 hours. Will you accept control? And then, at 9.42, I was over 30 degrees north at 9.37. I am changing frequency to MRX. Those are the last words transmitted by the captain of the Star Ariel, Kiwi John McPhee, Monday, 17th of January, 1949. The aircraft he piloted was on a routine passenger flight, 11 hours, Bermuda to Kingston, Jamaica. Despite a massive search involving a US battleship, two aircraft carriers, three dozen other sundry ships, and nothing was ever found of the Avro Tudor 4B aircraft, crew of seven and 13 passengers. In an airy mirror disappearance a year prior, January 1948, another Avro Tudor 4B, the Star Tiger, operated again by British South American Airways, vanished without a trace somewhere between the Azores and Bermuda. The disappearance of the Star Ariel and Star Tiger, these similar circumstances, the lack of wreckage, helped the hypotheses that there was something peculiar going on in this area. Strange forces, natural or otherwise, capable of dragging planes from flight mid-air, send navigation aids haywire, create massive ocean waves and vortexes that could send ships below the waves before their crews could even issue an SOS, draw them into watery graves, inside an area of the Atlantic which was dubbed the Bermuda Triangle, or The Devil's Triangle. Only, none of this was true. <coughs> At least according to the US Navy Coast Guard. Hate to spoil your fun. Statistically, it was no worse than any other similar area. Make a 500,000 square mile hexagon around Trinidad. A 500 square mile rectangle in the surrounds of Timor, you will see ships and planes sunk and crashed with alarming regularity before 1970, even in mild conditions. Whatever the hoodoo was, it now seems powerless against today's modern equivalent passenger aircraft and modern container ships. Those evil sea deities and ETs curse bitterly the invention accessibility of a GPS. Whatever you do, don't tell them about AI. Even the clearly man-made concoction, a triangle, was a red flag. Why not a pentangle? We were stuck believing in a triangle shape, named after one of the three sides, which happens to be the best place to holiday. That seemed to do the trick though, invariably led to copycat triangles. When the Bermuda began losing steam, the Dragon's, Dragon's triangle. triangle near Taiwan sprung forward to launch a hundred books and episodes on discovery. A plethora of pulp books came out in the 70s, seeing anomalies where there weren't any. The Nazca lines in Peru were UFO landing strips, all of which ignored completely. Our ancestors weren't numbskulls, and they could build pyramids without the help of aliens. To get back on topic here, what they ignored in the time around all these so-called mysterious disappearances were supposedly occurring, the elephant in the room, was, rather than magnetic fields, undersea bubbles, portals to the next dimension, the planes, vessels, technology, safety standards, communication and navigational abilities of the era were what chiefly contributed to their loss. Two of those losses attributable to the mysteries of the triangle occurred because the planes, Avro turbos weren't the most reliable, even killed their designer, and 
Oceans are big, and planes are relatively small. I enter into evidence. Malaysian Airlines MH370. Looking at the evidence, it was hard to plant any blame on the New Zealand pilot of the Star Aerial, John McPhee. Unlikely it was his error. I will get back to his bio in two ticks. Nor that of the pilot of the Star Tiger, and Captain Brian McMillan. He has his gravestone at the Stratford District Cemetery, Taranaki, New Zealand. That's right, McMillan was also a Kiwi. Died sometime and somewhere in the early morning hours of January the 30th, 1948, along with five crew and 25 passengers on board the Star Tiger. That's two New Zealanders who were piloting two of the most iconic disappearances in the Bermuda Triangle. McPhee and McMillan were decorated World War II pilots. John McPhee flew Liberator bombers first over Germany and then transferred to Asia as the war in Europe came to a close. Newspaper report, Christchurch Press, 13th February 1945. Warrant Officer J.H. McPhee of Fendleton Christchurch, who was recently mentioned in a cablegram describing the work of the Royal Air Force Liberator Bombers of the Strategic Air Force Eastern Air Command. Successful daylight attacks were made on Amapura near Mandalay, toward which the Japanese are withdrawing. McPhee had wanted to be a fighter pilot, but at six foot three he was too tall for the cockpit setup. After the war he swapped bombers for passenger aircraft flying for what we now know as British Airways. He had some aeronautical notables under his belt was a key member of the crew that made the record-breaking long-distance flight, February 1947, London to Ohakia Airport, New Zealand. For overseas listeners, that's in the lower half of the North Island. Co-piloting an Avro York, a derivative, make that mix and match, of the legendary Avro Lancaster bomber. A total time, a blistering, 59 hours. If anything points to the improvement of aircraft technology to come. It's this, another McPhee claim to fame. He was the first pilot to refuel mid-air over the Atlantic. In 1949, McPhee was 31 years old. In 1948, Brian Watson McMillan was 35 years old. At the age of 24, he was crowned the New Zealand ski champion in downhill. McMillan joined the RAF and got posted up in the north of India where incidentally he became the downhill champion of India there as well. He escaped capture as the Japanese rampaged through Burma. Redeployed in the European theatre, he became a squadron leader with the 582 Squadron RAF 1943, then wing commander and commanding officer of 227 Squadron Pathfinder Force RAF 1945, Newspaper report, London Gazette, 19th December 1944, citation. This officer set a fine example of skill, courage and devotion to duty in operations against the enemy. He has participated in a large number of sorties against strongly defended targets, including such centres as Berlin, Stuttgart, Duisburg and Kiel. In October 1944, when Commander McMillan took part in an attack on Cologne, in spite of considerable anti-aircraft fire, this intrepid pilot remained over the target for many minutes to press home a most determined and successful attack. This officer is a highly efficient flight commander whose sterling qualities have impressed all. The man captaining the Star Tiger, Brian McMillan, won the Distinguished Flying Cross and the Distinguished Service Order, the latter flying the Avro Lancaster III over Cologne. He too joined British Airways, then got posted to their subsidiary British South American Airways. What I'm trying to emphasise here, Macmillan was well versed with the controls and capabilities of the passenger aircraft he was flying. McPhee was a career pilot. After flying through Flak, and being hounded by Fokker Wolfs over Netherlands, BF-110s coming out of the night skies over Berlin, a Japanese Zero firing its cannons in your general direction, knowing if you did survive getting shot down, the odds were against a solo survival in the wilds of the Burmese jungle. A bout of adverse weather over the Atlantic wasn't going to phase these chaps.
They had shaken hands with death on numerous occasions. McPhee and Macmillan would have laughed off the notion of vortexes, water spouts and spooky triangles, pissed themselves they were in peril of being attacked by UFOs. Odds on, they were failed by the engineering and support of the plane they were rattling about in. Not that we'll ever know the full reasons for the demise conclusively. Unlike, say, the other Avro from the British South American Airways livery, that disappeared off the radar on the 2nd of August 1947. To get, what's the appropriate word, Paul? Our bearings. So far, I've given you details on the disappearance of two Avro aircraft over the Atlantic, 1948 and 49. There was an earlier one, and that got less airtime, but just as much speculation. The British South American Airways, Avro Lancastrian, the Stardust, disappeared on a flight between Buenos Aires, Argentina and Santiago, Chile. Searchers had a general idea where it went down. The final resting place for the Stardust and Eleven on board wouldn't be known for another 50 years, 50 years exactly, when climbers discovered the wreckage scattered over a mile radius, 15,000 feet up, on the Andes, on the Argentinian side. One of the gory details from that discovery were the conditions of the bodies, well the bits of them, been buried under all that snow for now five decades and they were almost perfectly preserved in clothing, boots, bags etc. It didn't take an air crash investigator to come to the conclusion in the whiteout conditions on the 2nd of August 1947 the pilot, Captain Cook, that's an easy one to remember, an Englishman, had diverted from his prescribed flight path to avoid the weather, subsequently miscalculated their altitude and location Still, like the Star Ariel and Star Tiger, not knowing the fate of Stardust for so long, during those 50 years where no one knew what had happened, conspiracy theories abounded. Every bit as weird as with the Bermuda Triangle disappearances. This is your captain speaking. Go back to your seat and buckle up. There's going to be some turbulence. Let's start with this one. Amongst the six passengers, there were also five crew by the way, were rumoured to be the deposed members of the Romanian royal family fleeing the Soviet Russians, who caught wind of where they were and placed a bomb on board to end their lineage. When it was pointed out, and there were actually no Romanians on the manifest, undeterred, the claimant said, They were travelling incognito. Next, on the manifest was an elderly German lady. She was entangled in the Fourth Reich in South America, moving from this single piece of fact, i.e. one German lady. The flight was carrying Nazi gold, and following from that, it was hijacked and secreted to a neo-Nazi secret unprescribed base, or one of all of the above. Next... Another single thread that was knitted nicely into a woolly jersey of intrigue. Another verifiable passenger was from Palestine, a jewellery trader. He was said to have millions and millions of dollars of diamonds sewn into the lining of his suit jacket, which was the key reason someone had undertaken the disappearance of an entire aircraft, kidnapping 11 crew and passengers. Next, the most persistent invention, even today... Now we know that plane's fate still has legs. There were British secret agents on board and carrying documents by the King's messenger. The significance of this escapes me. I'd love to hear from someone who can abandon logic and explain in the comments on YouTube. Why, why, why? Even if the diplomats were on board, which they weren't, it resulted in the crash. Next and what mysterious disappearance wouldn't be complete without aliens, UFOs, invisible higher beings for atheists and nerds, with the newspapers plugging the Roswell incident at the exact same time, the supposed crash and the disappearance of stardust were conflated into one. My brain hurts even thinking about this conclusion, which was dreamed up on the premise Cook's last three transmissions was the cryptic word Stendek S-T-E-N-D-E-C 
a word that meant nothing to the South American flight controllers, appeared unearthly and cloaked in mystery, when it was an anagram that was drummed in to the ex-RAF pilot, Cook, severe turbulence encountered, now descending, emergency crash landing, Stendic. I'm not too sure of the translation in Klingon, sorry. Summary. Three flights over three years, in total dead 52. This isn't going to be one of those hundreds of videos, books and podcasts that use the word solved in respect to the Devil's Triangle. I'm not going to banter and waste your time by saying solved when the proper term should be theory, wild theories, unbalanced theories even. Like, say, Sir Edmund Hillary went hunting the mythical Yeti high up in the Himalayas, which actually happened. More on that at the end. Even if the wreckage of the aerial and tiger are located, that would be approximately 5 kilometres below the surface, scattered on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. The impact and subsequent degradation mean it's highly doubtful in the extreme, even if an autonomous underwater vehicle was to stumble upon the wreckage, any visual examination would reveal anything. What I can say is undeniable, and the post-war British aero industry was every bit as terminal as the motor industry. More misses than hits. I can think of many successful adaptions of passenger aircraft into military aircraft in this era. The Douglas DC-3 and Yonkers JU-52 spring to mind. Not the other way around. As a quasi-government department, these aircraft were somewhat hoisted upon the airline. Moreover, there was also a very detailed inquiry into the loss of the Star Tiger, which went over many of the theories. Their conclusion, and the complete absence of reliable evidence as to either the nature or the cause of the accident of Star Tiger, the court has not been able to more than suggest possibilities, none of which reaches the level even of probability. What happened in this case will never be known, and the fate of the Star Tiger must remain an unsolved mystery. Ditto, the summary of the 1949 Star Aerial investigation. Through lack of evidence, due to no wreckage having been found, the cause of the accident is unknown. Maybe there was an inherent fault in the Tudor variants that resulted in them exploding mid-air, before the pilots even got a chance to fire off a mayday. Looking at the design of the aircraft through modern modelling, in order to establish any weaknesses, the proximity of the cabin heater to the hydraulic lines was one major area of concern. Another theory, and let's put it in the more salacious reasoning and abandoned objective thinking file, was that they were both destroyed by bombs being placed on board. I was already getting the beginnings of a migraine with all the UFOs, the unnamed yet known saboteur proposal was by Aussie Don Bennett, another RAF World War II pilot who ended up as a pilot for British European Airways, the old name for BA, then rose through the ranks at the subsidiary British South American Airways till he was on the board. When Bennett got fired from that position, he thought, stuff you, and went out and purchased two Avro Turbo 5s and started his own airline called Air Flight. Rugby buffs may have heard about what followed. The rugby equivalent of the Manchester United team tragedy at Munich Airport. One of the Turbo Fives was chartered by the Welsh rugby supporters to go to a Five Nations game in Ireland and back on March the 12th, 1950. This flight was oversold. When it was coming back into land and re on the return flight, it stalled and crashed and killed 80 of the 83 on board. This is known as the Landau Tragedy, L-L-A-N-D-O-W. At the time, Landau was the largest loss of life in a passenger aircraft crash to date, determined to be the result of the aircraft being misloaded. Don Bennett wasn't therefore the most credible witness when it came to the performance of the aircraft and the goings-on at his old employers, which he had a large beef against. Wait, there's more! Just when you thought it was safe to fly air flight, 
airlines again. Book a flight on their last remaining Avro. If there's another crash I need to briefly touch upon, involving the aircraft's designer, the famous Roy Chadwick, the man behind the Lancaster. Chadwick died when the prototype of the Tudor II crashed on takeoff August 1947, three weeks after the Lancastrian had plonked itself into the Andes. The Tudor II, by the way, was the first British pressurised airliner. His death was due to an engineering blunder on a massive scale. The left and right trims had been misaligned, meaning if you went to bank left, you went right. There we have it, good listeners. Feel confident aeronautical buffs will add to my layman's summations and histrionics in the YouTube comment section. Correct me even. There was, still is, a lot to unpack here. Whatever happened to the two aircraft piloted by the two Kiwis that both disappeared on routine flights will likely never be known. Doubtless still continue to feature front and centre on books and dubious docos for decades to come. Thank you for your time here today. If you missed it, which looking at the meagre listening numbers, you likely did, I recently did a podcast where Sir Edmund Hillary went yeti hunting. Although, on occasion, I can take the purse. It's a Kiwi hobby after all. That's 100% true. Hillary did go searching for the mythical yeti. Go on. Spend some more time here today listening to that expedition. It's a goodie bubbly thingy on the screen or link in the podcast description. Before I leave, as a valued listener, I'd like to add a final safety tip as we come into land. In 1950, an RAF Lincoln bomber crashed into a Welsh mountain, killing all six of the crew. That was an Avro Lincoln, to be specific. In light of this, be sure to pass on the key messages from this podcast to your travel agents when opting for an airline. Bye for now.